Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where uh, you're joining us from today. My name is Laura Van Dagen with the Ames Marketing Team, and I will be your meeting host. So with that, I'd like to welcome our two presenters today, Dr. Gerhard Planner and Chris Gordon. Dr. Gerhard Planner has been helping organizations execute operational and supply chain transformations for over 20 years. His background includes being a professor, an author, and working for some of the largest companies in the world, companies like Microsoft, Cisco, HP, J&J, &J, Shell, Apple, Ford, uh, really uh, some of the top companies in the world. Also speaking today is Chris Gordon. Chris has worked in supply chain consulting and operations across Europe, the U.S., and India for over 25 years. He's driven dozens of supply chain initiatives with a heavy focus on leveraging analytical evidence to promote major business change. Gerhardt will share his perspective on best practices for moving from theory to implementation for supply chain segmentation analytics. And Chris is going to share some thoughts about the evolution of supply chain segmentation and how cutting edge companies are using optimization to take things to the next level. So with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Gerhard. Hello there. Hey, thanks for joining. I, I wish I could uh, meet each of you in person and uh, shake your hand, but that's not the way it's going to work today. Uh, the topic that we're going to talk about today is extremely exciting. I, I, I want you to feel the excitement because it is very timely and very critical to supply chain management competitiveness. Those organizations that have uh, adopted this have found huge uh, benefits, and we can talk about some of that. Uh, when we talk about segmentation, there's a lot of aspects or applications of segmentation. Today, we're only going to go through three of them. Uh, but you can think in your mind about other ways that this can be applied. Now, for the objectives of today's seminar, uh, the objective is <coughs> of this webinar is to help have the listener understand the need to break free from this one-size-fits-all approach to supply chain management that we've been locked into. During the webinar, you're going to get some basic understanding of uh, what is segmentation and how it applies to supply chain management and manufacturing. And you'll share some, we'll share some examples of how, uh, how segmentation has been applied in some organizations and what kind of impact it's had on their supply chain and in their manufacturing settings. Next. Segmentation attempts to differentiate our area of interest, which is uh, usually around products. Uh, then we'd group these items in this area into groupings with common characteristics. Uh, supply chain incorporates suppliers, manufacturing, customers. In this webinar, you're going to get examples of each of those three perspectives. From the supplier side, we're going to take a look at an aerospace example. And from the internal manufacturing side, we're going to take a look at a high-tech company. And then from the outbound customer side of the supply chain, we're going to consider a pharma distribution, pharmaceutical distribution company. Uh, next, <coughs> segmentation looks for common characteristics. This diagram shows six possible ways to break down and define these characteristics. So when segmenting, uh, you need to figure out which of these characteristic sets is, is the most important, uh, which ones are you going to focus on, and which ones have the direct, most direct impact on your specific goals. Uh, once you have these groupings defined, and then, then we search out or we search through our various uh, products or, or customers, whatever it is that we're segmenting, and we search through them and identify what are the optimizing tools or methodologies that will help us to uh, make this the most powerful, uh, impactful uh, uh, system for that particular segment. So we do it by segment as opposed to a one-size-fits-all approach. Next. Now, how does segmentation work? Well, supply chain segmentation utilizes a three-pronged approach. And if you look on the bottom of the diagram here, we're, we're trying to optimize return on availability. The three prongs that I'm talking about are the A, B, and C across the top there. A, of course, being product lifecycle focused. And as you can see from the little list there, products go through various lifecycle stages. And what's, what you're going to see here in a moment is that in each of those stages, we manage the product differently. We don't manage the product the same. And, but, but traditional manufacturing systems has us managing each one of those stages in the same way, and that's where we run into trouble. Uh, B is focused on cost reduction. 
similarly, you see a list of various aspects of costs that might play into the segmentation structure. And item C is, a, is focused on the benefits. And again, there's a list there. Next. All right, starting with A, we're going to go through A, B, and C that we saw in that previous diagram. Starting with A, which with the life cycle stages, uh, in this example here that you see in this diagram, you can see the typical life cycle where the product starts in the MPI, new product introduction stage. During this stage, demand is highly undefined. Uh, there's a lot of stockouts are a constant problem. Um, autom automated forecasting is nearly impossible. Uh, SNOP is used for defining demand. Then as the product moves into the uh, growth and maturity stages, where volume increases and stabilizes, the forecasting, planning, and scheduling becomes more routine and more automated, and often uh, hands-off's -off approach is, is the best to use. So planners uh, should be minimizing their effort in the growth and maturity phases, and automated forecasting and planning and scheduling is often more effective. Whereas in the introduction phase, it was, you know, the, the involvement of planners was critical. Now, later in the declining and end of life stages, the process becomes less automated, and SNOP starts kicking in again and is used regularly. Margins start getting very low. Excessive inventory becomes a huge concern uh, because of the obsolescence of these, uh, it, you know, end of life products. So we can see that in each stage, management of the demand and the corresponding planning and scheduling process are quite different. A one size fits all mentality does not work. Next. Now, moving on to the second prong of return on availability, we focus on various cost drivers and their impact. And what's important here is an understanding of how the different drivers attack cost. All these drivers are not relevant, necessarily relevant for each of the segmentation exercises, and there may be others that are not listed here. This is just an example. Um, but what, you're, you, what you do is you identify which ones have the biggest impact, which ones are the drivers that attack cost the most the most effectively. We identify those drivers which have that largest in impact based on the goals that we've set early on. Next. C then is, is our last piece, and that's where we talk about customer segments. And again, I'm breaking this down in only three tiers, tier one, two, and three, to keep the example simplistic. You may have many more tiers. Uh, but at, in this portion here, what we recognize are that all customers are not treated the same or, 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 or perform the same. For example, in the, uh, the pharma example that we're going to be looking at a little later, uh, which is a mail order pharmaceutical delivery service, tier one customer is the hospital, tier two is a clinic, and tier three would be the uh, private residence. Now, each of these tiers required a different level of response. The private residence is mostly just refilling a prescription, and there is isn't any urgency, you know, immediate overnight kind of delivery urgency with those particular products. But in the case of the hospital, the lack of availability of medication could be life-threatening. So a tier one customer uh, tends to be very easily defined. It's the one that's the most critical, uh, that requires the most attention, and, the, and also probably the one that uh, has the most uh, revenue control for your organization. For the uh, high tech, tech example that we're going to look at in a little while, the tier one customer in high tech would be something like the fries or the best buy. So it's very easy to pick out who your tier ones are. The other tiers are a little harder to, put, uh, to break out because it depends on what their characteristic demands are. Uh, usually there's more than three tiers, but again, this is just an example of what, what we're looking at in this piece of the, uh, the driver. Uh, going on next. Now, business, on this slide, what we see is an example of how key business drivers are evaluated as to their impact on the overall return on availability. This helps us determine which factors need to be built into our segmentation approach. Again, this is, this is very critical in, in, in picking out only those that we need to have uh, to bring into our final uh, solution for our decision process. We don't want all of these cost factors uh, playing a role. We just want to look at which ones have that high impact and then we pull those through. And next. Okay, now here, here what we see is, is the initial stage in the development of a segmentation matrix. Now, 
we've, we've just talked about three different aspects or three dimensions. Let me uh, show how that is played out on this matrix. The purpose of this diagram is to build out these three segmentation dimensions or prongs that we have uh, been discussing. One was the customer, and of course across the top you see tier one customer, tier two customer, tier three customer, again only using three to keep life simple. Uh, we see product life cycle down the left hand side, and again we're only using three to make life simple, end of life, active, and launch. Uh, and then within each life cycle stage, then we have three cost of availability stages, high, medium, and low. Uh, using that, we can dimension out, we can have cubes that show each one of those inter intersections of those three dimensions. And that's how we actually diagram out uh, what we attempt to uh, later break out as segments, how we later cluster those segments together. Um, so using this matrix, then we define each of the intersections and then break them into su su these significant segments. So uh, next, taking that model then, we move on into an example here. In this example, we see the critical goals of an organization are availability and lead time. You see that, like if you look under Tier 1 customer on the top there, you see availability and lead time. Uh, and then what the business model that would best fit this situation? What business model uh, approach would we use? You see in the various business model columns there, you see custom, efficient, and agile. You see different levels of performance uh, based on, uh, in, in, in the purple upper left-hand corner there, you see a, a Tier 1 customer work, working with a product that is in launch, the launch lifecycle stage. And here you want availability, quick response, and lead time, and use a, using a custom business model. Now, on the uh, bottom right-hand side, we see a Tier 3 customer that is in the active life cycle stage with high cost of availability. In this case, you know, we, we have an efficient model. We look for an efficient model, and that's the kind of business model that would best service an active, high availability Tier 3 customer. So. You see, it takes a while to fill out this matrix. This is probably the biggest part of the job, is filling out this matrix. Uh, next. Now here is that same matrix that we had, matrix that we had filled out earlier in the previous slide. But you can see it grouped now into segments. In this diagram, we see a set of data broken into these various segmentation categories. In this case, we see five segments each of which is grouped into clusters with approximately the same set of characteristics. These will become the segments that we use for the development of our supply chain uh, optimization strategy. Uh, you can see uh, the blue upper left-hand corner all, kind, all tend to have the same set of characteristics. So that cluster would be one segment, and then that segment is then we figure out what is the best planning uh, and scheduling approach to manage that particular segment. And that segment is managed very differently than the bottom, say, bottom right-hand corner, which has the yellow, uh, which has uh, very long lead times, you know, 35 to 50 days in that range there, uh, and has a very low availability, whereas the upper left-hand blue had very high availability. It's a totally different customer, totally different set of requirements. Why are we using the same one-size-fits-all approach to manage both of those situations? That's where segmentation comes in. It makes uh, the various pieces of this uh, more effective and increases the performance in each of these segments. Uh, next. Now, I mentioned to you that we're going to talk about three different examples. Uh, moving on to those three examples, this is the first. In this case, we're talking an aerospace manufacturing company, and we're focused on the supply side of the uh, supply chain for this aerospace company. Um, a Tier 1 supplier is a supplier that works, just to, to help you put your arms around it, a Tier 1, you look across the top, you see that we're talking about Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 suppliers. Okay, we're on the supply side here. A Tier 1 supplier is a supplier that works with components that are critical to the manufacturing process or which do a very large volume of, of this organization's business. 
So I, I'd like to draw attention to specifically segment two here. Uh, if you look at segment two, which is kind of in the middle of the uh, left-hand side, um, you're going to see something that requires short lead time, quick turnaround, and a very agile business model. So why, why do you have such a short lead time here in this tier, two, tier one supplier, highly active product? And, the, and if you think about it, it's, it's, it's quite reasonable. If, if these are going to be products that for this particular manufacturer, if the, uh, you know, we're talking in the high volume situation, we're talking about a repetitive manufacturing situation, if the products are not on site when they need it, the whole production line is going to shut down. These are critical to the, the continued production of the continued success of that production line. So they're managed very differently than, than for example, uh, segment six, which probably is in more of your nuts and bolts category. Uh, of which we can easily have an, an excess stock, safety stock isn't going to be as expensive, that type of a thing. Two are probably high, high again, segment two is probably very expensive parts, and, and some form of JIT Kanban is critical for that production line to keep going, whereas uh, segment six is, is probably uh, replenished based on some kind of an EOQ, uh, lot for lot type of a system. So. Very different, and, and, and why do we manage them in a one-size-fits-all mentality, which is the way most of our ERPs are? Uh, I don't know, but this ERPs can be adjusted to treat each of these products, each of these segments of products differently, and that's what, what we try to do uh, when we look at this segmentation structure. Uh, let's go on next. This one is now a pharmaceutical example. Uh, in the pharma case, we're talking again about this, this mail order pharmacy. Uh, in, in the tier one customer is the hospital. Again, the tier two is the uh, clinic, and the tier three is, is a private residence. Um, it was a little easier to break out what the tiers were in this particular case. Uh, and since we are talking very much on the, the, the customer side, on the, the outbound side of the supply chain, um, in this case, we take a look at the uh, the, the, under the Tier 1 customer, you can see what the areas of impact or the areas of importance are. Shipping criticality is, 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 is very important. Um, lead time, also very important. And then we look at what business model is the most effective in performing or performing for that particular uh, cube there, for that particular cluster. Uh, if we take a look at um, I think the one that's probably the most interesting is, is segment three. Uh, in segment three here, we see uh, very high shipping criticality. We need to see one day lead time. Uh, why is that segment so important? Uh, why does it have such a high priority over the others? Well, it turns out that in the, uh, the high shipping criticality items, the high cost of availability items, are items that have to be refrigerated, and they are, are shipped cold in cold packs, and uh, one-day delivery is important or else the product spoils. So that has a very different, uh, you know, aspect to its situation to it. So you see uh, segment three goes across all customers, tier one, tier two, and tier three customers because of that cold uh, pack that has to be that refrigeration requirement that has to be with each of the products. So in this example, it's an interesting example where you have a um, segment that goes across all three customer tiers. Now if we look at, the, uh, for example, tier four, uh, segment four, uh, what we see there is items that are probably uh, prescription renewals. Uh, Custom, you know, people uh, that are getting their prescriptions uh, delivered to their homes, uh, they still have some supply, you know, a week or two of supply on hand. Uh, shipment uh, response time is not that critical. Uh, but if we look at item one, uh, segment one, uh, in the upper left-hand corner there, what we have is hospitals that have some level of emergency uh, that need a response uh, to, you know, I mean, it could be a life-threatening situation. So you need very high performance, high response in that area, not because it's refrigerated, but just because of the criticality of the, of the product itself. So that's, that's how we build our segments out. We think through what is, it, what is it that we're trying to accomplish and what makes the most sense. Next. 
in this case now we're talking about the high tech example and the pain point in the high tech example again in the high tech we're looking at internal to the manufacturing process in this high tech example the point pain point was that they had a large number of stockouts for products that were critical and then a large number of obsolescence or obsolete items for products that were in the end of life uh, so they had basically Play the wrong inventory in the wrong place at the wrong time. That was the problem that we were trying to look at here. In, 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 in the high-tech sector, which um, just often high-tech is compared with, uh, with, with uh, fashion apparel in that if you don't have the product on the shelf when the customer comes there looking for it, they're going to go to some other product. They're going to go to some other product. They're going to switch. You, it's very fad-oriented, fashion or fad-oriented. Um, so you have to have that product on the shelf when the customer is looking for it. So in, in, it is, in, this, uh, in this case here, it's a perfect example of in, introducing, trying to introduce a one-size-fits-all mentality into both the supply and the demand side inventory management systems. And it's, in this example, we can see in segment one and four, both of those segments, segment one and four, would use some form of SNLP. Uh, it's a new product. They don't have a lot of forecasts. They don't have a lot of history to work up with. They, they have to get a real sense of what the customer uh, response is going to look like. So without it, any history, you, you know, automated forecasting doesn't work at all. But if you look down in segments two, segment two specifically, here's where automated uh, uh, planning and scheduling systems would be actually much more effective than manual systems. The, uh, the automated systems would actually be able to do the planning and the scheduling, the forecasting, whatever, very effectively. It would give you a high performance. And then if you move down to three, segment three, now here we're looking at obsolescence, end of life. And what we're trying to do is the reduce stockouts, eliminate stockouts on these mature products. Um, that would be an enormous win if you could uh, cut down the, the number of stockouts that are occurring here. Now, in this case, that's exactly what we were able to accomplish. I mean, we, we took a, the resources, the one-size-fits-all planning resources, pulled them out of segment two, shifted them into segments one, uh, mostly into one, and then and some into three as well. So the, the, uh, the planning process, the planners were more effective on those products that needed more attention. Um, put to primarily in an automated mode, and, and you know this diagram doesn't really show it, but two was the majority of the products, right? It was probably oh I don't know 50, 60 percent of the product base was in the two in, in, the, in the segment two category. Automated that and, and, and made it much more effective. Uh, you know, minimized inventory in those areas and, and managed them based on on demand. So again, segmentation allowed allowed a huge win in this situation. Uh, moving away from uh, misuse of resources and moving us closer to a more efficient, uh, per efficiently performing uh, demand supply uh, planning and scheduling process. Now, next, using that same example now, that high tech example, uh, where we had four different segments, uh, we're now mapping each of those segments you see across the top there one, two, three, four. We're mapping each of those four segments in to the tool set that we need in order to optimize the performance of that segment. Now, if you look down the left-hand side, and, and this is very, you know, this is very strictly an example, right? Don't uh, take this as like the only tool set. But I just threw something together so we could all kind of get a, a sense of what we're talking about here. But there's, a, there's an example tool set down the left-hand side. Now, each one of the segments, just like we were talking, has has different requirements, has different uh, uh, planning and scheduling needs. Um, again, this is a simplistic example, but as you can see, each of the segments would util utilize a specific set of tools focused on the needs of that segment. The blue boxes are tools that are needed and already in existence within the organization. The yellow are those that partially existed, maybe not fully executed. And then the red are tools that we would find as missing within that organization and need to be brought in in order to drive that segment to full efficiency. And so this, this diagram then says, okay, what do we need to do in our SAP environment or what do we need to do in our planning processing environment to make uh, each of these segments perform optimally? Next. 
All right, now what I have here, I have repeatedly mentioned the need for segmentation to be goal-driven. In this chart, we see how goals are mapped into each one of the segments, and the goals set for each segment is not the same. You know, inventory goals, uh, return of percent, of, you know, percent of inventory uh, on hold, that kind of a thing, safety stock levels, that kind of thing. Performance for each segment will be different. End of life products wouldn't have the same types of inventory performance targets as mature products. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, the planning cadence of products in different segments wouldn't be the same. We wouldn't need to have as much attention paid to end of life products, for example. We may plan the mature products uh, regularly based on forecast, but the end of life products might be planned strictly on, on an as needed, on demand basis. Uh, the most interesting aspect of this chart, though, is, is the uh, the touch level, the bottom there, the touch level of the planners. You see, most of the uh, most organizations have planners across groups of products, regardless of where they would, what segment they would fall into, and the touch level, you know, the amount of effort planners should put into planning and scheduling products is very different based on the segment that they belong to. In the case of mature products. Automated systems are actually more reliable and more efficient uh, than than planners. But in the case of uh, uh, you know new product introductions, uh, the planner is, is is critical. There's there's no way you can do this without the planner being involved. You know the SNLP type uh, effort, and and the same is uh, true on the um, on the other end of the life cycle on the uh, end of life products. Uh, planning resources uh, have more application there than they would in, again, the, the, the highly repetitive uh, life phases of the product. Now, you can see across the bottom there, segment one uh, would have a lot of attention, and segment one, of course, was the new product introduction stuff, and then segment four, uh, medium amount, but segments two, three, five, and six would have very low um, effort or involvement of the planners. So, not only are we uh, planning our inventory better, but we're planning our planners better and our schedulers better. Uh, the, that touch point is, is, is a very critical example of how segmentation can help your organization be more, important, more effective and more efficient. Now, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to, to, to Chris. Chris? Yeah, thanks, Gerhard. So supply chain segmentation has been around since the the 90s, the mid-90s, and it came about because uh, European retailers weren't happy with the margin they were making on grocery products alone, and they decided they, they had an inkling that if they moved into general merchandise, they would create more margin for their business. And in doing so, they applied the same supply chain approach to general merchandise as they did to uh, regular grocery products, and, and it didn't work. So they quickly built another segment, and then they continued through that to build segments out. So it's still um, a minority of organizations that are using segmentation. Uh, the ones that are using it are using it very successfully to tame chaos, and as Gerhard said, it's a great way to focus resources as well. Today it's typically a, a strategic tool, so it's used to reconfigure the supply chain occasionally, uh, and a percentage of organizations are, are able to resegment on an ad hoc basis. So it's just not a segmentation on a, a one hit. They're, they're doing it on a, a weekly or monthly or quarterly basis. So it's been 15 years now since the grocery retailers started to work with segmentation. And we believe that it's time to evolve the techniques and tooling further uh, and embedded in business as usual. So uh, we don't believe that uh, segmentation belongs on, uh, only on a kind of consulting environment or initiative environment. We think it should be part of the business and part of the business DNA. So there's nothing to stop us doing auto automated segment flagging. We can, we can do that now. We can optimize based on the best segment. Uh, for a particular product and a particular tier of customer. And we can uh, uh, use tooling to help us decide what the best next step is or the best next segment is for a product within the supply chain. More likely, though, 
uh, organizations uh, are going to trust a machine-generated segment prescription. So our tooling would, would bring to, to the planner to consider there would be a notification and, and the planner can either decline, adapt, or accept that prescription. Um, if the planner decides to accept that prescription, then it should be immediately deployed within the organization. We believe that the end game is to answer the question, what's the cost of my network versus an optimum network on an ongoing basis? So typically what we see now is network optimization or end-to-end -end supply chain modeling, uh, which incorporates, uh, when it's done well, a segmentation methodology is, is often a project. And uh, I, our hypothesis is instead of doing that on a project basis when we've got funds for projects and initiatives, why don't we resegment on based on the needs of the business and why don't we reconfigure our network based on the needs of the business as the business case emerges. At Ames we're building a series of basic and complex segmentation models. We're very keen to promote the development of segmentation to the next level. Uh, and that specifically is how do you embed segmentation within the DNA, the business as usual, uh, within your organization? And how do you do that with a modeling and optimization tool set? We believe that the technology exists to make rapid progress on this. And in fact, we're making rapid progress ourselves on building out these models. And we offer here an invite to participate. So the models that we're building, the model frameworks, are going to be made available free to current AIMS users. Plus, as well as that, to participants, um, we're, we're, if you're interested, we're, we're able to engage you uh, with uh, webinars with your business peers, such that we can together build out some of the model designs uh, for segmentation. So if you're motivated to um, play a role in this innovation and, and help take segmentation to the next level, which is really the uh, amendment in, in business as usual, you're, uh, you're invited to participate in a series of webinars and uh, uh, conversations with your business peers. Laura is going to give you details on how you might sign up for that. Over to you, Laura. Well, thank you, Chris. So hopefully this provided a good introduction to supply chain segmentation and gave you some things to think about. So I'd like to uh, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed the information presented. A big thank you to our presenters, Gerhard and Chris, for a very informative webcast. Uh, we'll be sending out a link to the video within the next week, so be on the lookout for that email. And if you have any questions for our presenters after this webinar, please feel free to reach out to them directly. Um, on this slide is their contact information. We'll also include um, their contact information in the follow-up email. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, if you would like to participate um, in those segmentation webinars and the engagement, get those frameworks uh, and begin the dialogue with us, just reach out to Chris Gordon and um, he'll get you plugged into that. So if you'd like to also learn more about um, the AIMS optimization and analytics software, please check out our uh, website, aims.com, or email us at info.aims.com, and uh, we'll be ha happy to answer any questions that you may have. So with that, we're going to conclude our webinar. Thank you so much for attending today, and stay tuned.